All right, hi. Uh, thanks for attending my talk about lessons learned while developing cookbooks for a Windows-centric organization. Um, my name is Justin Reve, um, and like Colin said, I work at CUNY Mutual Group. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I served in the United States Army from 2005 to 2014 as an infantryman. I'm a huge PowerShell nerd. Um, I gained a real enthusiasm for PowerShell when I was going to school for systems administration. Um, I love playing board games, so most recently I'm playing Gloomhaven. So if you're a board gamer in the crowd and you've played Gloomhaven, awesome. If you've heard all the hype, it's true. It's a great game, uh, so check it out. Um, I'm also a PC gamer, so I've been kind of a computer nerd ever since growing up. I, I think my first PC was a Windows 95 Packard Bell um, desktop computer that my parents got and said I spent entirely too much time on. Um, I'm also a DevOps advocate. Um, so I'm currently working on a cross-functional team uh, at Keenan Mutual Group, um, trying to bridge the gap between application developers and traditional infrastructure and operations. Um, and I'm really trying to help foster a DevOps-centric culture. Um, I went to my first DevOps days back in 2017, and I, I fell in love with the concept of, of DevOps-centric organizations. Um, so a little bit about the purpose and scope of this presentation. Um, I want to start by giving everybody a chance to run for the door. Um, so this talk is going to be about chef adoption and Windows environments. And it's definitely geared towards uh, newer to intermediate users, management who are considering chef inside of their environment, and architects that are trying to determine if chef is a good fit. I'm happy to share some personal code and projects on Slack at Rogue Automation. Um, and I'm definitely happy to sanitize some of the, the code that we've written um, in-house so that it's not so proprietary. Um, one final note, uh, please hold all questions till the end. Um, so this is my first presentation at a conference, and I don't want to go over time. And there's only a certain amount of time to let the next speaker prepare. Um, so I wanted to start off with a quick snapshot of where we were before we started our chef journey. Um, we had PowerShell desired state configuration in-house before I joined the organization. Um, but it was used in such a way that was overly restrictive and actually uh, caused issues and caused site outages rather than reliability. Uh, site settings were being reverted um, from where development teams wanted them to be, which was causing whole sites to go down. Uh, so the organization naturally backed away from configuration management, not fully understanding how to use it yet. Um, we had a lot of random PowerShell and VB scripts. Um, you've probably seen um, this in, in your own organizations, a, a batch script calling a VB script that calls a PowerShell script. Um, and it can be um, very difficult to decipher that and figure out what's going on. Um, we used SCCM for pretty much everything, including registry settings after the fact of provisioning. So we would rely on SCCM to push out a package to, to change a, a registry value in a server, for example, once it hit the network. And version control, uh, that's for developers, right? Um, this git thing, um, we don't use that, right? We had file name v1, file name v2. Um, that was the, the semblance of our version control. And, you know, admittedly, every once in a while, um, I'll break it back into the habit of, of just, um, I'm not going to put this in Git. I'm just going to do v1, v2. And then I start to think, what happens if I lose that? And finally, it goes without saying that we didn't have any sort of CI CD pipelines whatsoever. Um, without version control, how can you initiate CI CD? Um, so let's talk a bit about how my organization came to identify Chef as a solution that it wanted um, and, uh, and use for that for configuration management. So like most, most organizations trying to find their way in the digital expanse, um, we asked for help. We had a consulting company called Break Free Solutions come in, and they helped us uh, do these things called value stream maps. Um, so value stream maps are kind of like process mapping, but it's a, a little bit more advanced than that. Uh, process mapping, you'll, you'll, you'll probably map an individual process from start to finish. Um, with value stream maps, you take all the processes and procedures um, that you need, and you map those out. Um, to your end state, which is usually software, a deliverable iteration of software. Um, it might be a configured environment for an application team. Um, it has its or origins in manufacturing, um, following parts around a factory floor. Um, but it gets a lot more complex when it comes to IT. Um, it's a lot easier to follow a part around a factory floor than it is to follow um, handoffs of processes and procedures between teams. So the data can be very difficult to gather. Um, and even if it's not 100% accurate, you didn't grab every granular piece of data, it usually paints a pretty clear picture. Um, so I just want to show you a sample value stream map. I'm not going to linger on this too long because I promised a lot of deliverables with this presentation. Um, this is kind of what a value stream tile might look like. You'll see information like number of developers involved, how often the step fails, which teams are involved in the step, the name of the step, um, the controller technology used to accomplish the task, 
um, how long something sits in queue, right? Um, this is especially important for identifying handoffs between teams, which is where a lot of processes tend to break down uh, when you don't have end-to-end -end ownership of a product. Um, and then finally, how long it actually takes to complete the task when you actually start the work. Um, so here's a sample mock-up of a value stream map. Um, I've already done some analysis of this uh, value stream map to, to speed things along here. The first couple of steps I've indicated with the rabbit are pretty fast. Um, we, we can understand that these steps might have efficiencies to be gained, um, but things kind of slow down at the third step, which I've indicated with the turtle. Uh, we might be able to drive efficiencies in the first and second step, but work isn't ever going to flow any faster, really, unless we speed up the spe step with the turtle, which may just be a process change. It might be taking ownership of a process onto a single team, or it might um, involve using a process or, or, or a tool like Chef uh, to automate. And the same is true for steps following. If, if we don't automate the step with the turtle, work is still going to all stack up at that spot uh, with the turtle on the map. Um, so one of the, the, the major advantages of value stream mapping isn't just to identify what your processes and procedures look like. Um, it's to identify where the, the step is that you should really focus your first, first automation. Um, and these, these maps evolve too, right? So once we've uh, remediated the, the third step in this process, your bottleneck might shift to another, another step in the process, and that's where you should really focus on your next piece of automation. Um, so we had a few principal conclusions from our own value stream maps that confirmed some of our initial biases. Um, first is we really needed to start using infrastructure, infrastructure as code for provisioning um, ARM templates in Azure or using PowerShell um, on-prem to, to provision some of our, our resources, um, including and beyond servers. The second was um, it wasn't just an infrastructure problem. Our development teams needed to deliver smaller iterations of software. They were delivering such large chunks of software that it was taking weeks or months to go through QA and QMC. And while the, uh, the development teams have made great strides, um, we still have a, a long ways to go with this. And finally, um, what we're going to talk about most today is configuration management for environmental configuration. We had a massive amount of configuration drift between instances that were even on the same um, domain. Uh, it was very, very difficult to identify differences between configurations, especially in IIS. Um, so why did we choose Chef? Um, first, strong local development and test capabilities. Uh, test Kitchen was really awesome to be able just to spin up an instance, try out my code, and not have to worry about um, environmental cleanup afterwards inside of our, our infrastructure, which is primarily VMware-based. So it can be quite difficult to, to just spin up a VM and then, and then tear it back down um, ad hoc, especially for, for lots of testing. Um, Platform agnostic. While this talk is primarily focused on Windows, uh, we're adopting more and more Linux inside of our environment. So being able to use the same configuration management language between platforms was extremely important to us. There's also a strong community. Um, every time you need help, if you go to Slack, somebody's there to answer that question, and that's, that's pretty great. There's a ton of open source projects. The sous chefs are doing amazing work, and, and, and it's really, really awesome to see the community um, there's also great, uh, well-established learning patterns. Learn.chef.io has amazing self-paced training as well as Linux Academy. And finally, Chef automates eyes on glass. Having that view into your infrastructure was really empowering. Um, so let's start off with local development. Uh, for local development, uh, our organization chose to use Hyper-V for a few reasons. Um, we were just starting our cloud journey, uh, and, and we still kind of are. And so building random servers in Azure was something that our security wasn't really happy with us uh, potentially doing. Uh, so we decided to bring uh, virtualization down to our, our laptops. It's also great for isolating test instances um, just for the security purpose, right? So now if you're isolating tests to a local network on your machine, you're, you're isolating risk. And to, to us, that was an appealing factor of using Hyper-V. Um, there is a couple of uh, things that, that you need to know about using Hyper-V. Um, first, if you want to use Hyper-V as your test kitchen driver, you're going to have to be on Windows 8.1 or newer in order to virtualize against your local hardware. Um, if you can't use Hyper-V and you're on Windows 7, um, try using VirtualBox or Vagrant um, to, to, to do your uh, local development. So there, there definitely are some more gotchas. Um, you might have to play some quote games. So, for example, Microsoft likes to put spaces in things, and this can cause a lot of headaches when you're dealing with code. It's, it, this is an example of a kitchen YAML where we have to put single quotes around double quotes just because the word default switch has a space in it. So you might run into a lot of these if you're trying to adopt test kitchen and use Hyper-V. 
Um, and you also have to be mindful of over allocation of RAM to your, to your local virtual machines. There's this really ambiguous error that's pretty uh, notorious called undefined method for nil class. And that error will pop up for quite a few errors uh, within Test Kitchen. Um, in our case, um, we had, I think, three programs generally open on our laptops, PowerShell, Visual Studio Code, and Chrome. And you can probably guess which one was taking the bulk of the RAM. Um, and finally, PowerShell must be running as an admin during Kitchen runs. While Chef DK and Chef Workstation uh, run under the context of administrator, it's po po possible to call these commands from a regular PowerShell window. Um, when it's not running as administrator, you can do most of the functions, but um, things like checking for Hyper-V virtual switches or looking for uh, Hyper-V virtual hard drives, um, it just can't get to the correct uh, paths for those if it's not running as administrator. And so let's talk a little bit about domain joining and test kitchen. I've gone through some pains with this and in, in trying to make this work, and I've seen others on Slack try to do it as well. Um, we found it's best to try to avoid this if possible. The reason being is Test Kitchen is meant to be local development and kind of isolated, right? Um, when you start bringing things into the, the domain, it gets a lot more difficult, right? Um, because you have to clean up. And so that's outside of Test Kitchen. So instead of having a very simplified test harness, now you're adding an additional overhead just to have a test instance. And then um, dealing with real credentials during Test Kitchen can also be cumbersome, right? Because to join your domain, you're going to have to pass in valid credentials into this ephemeral virtual machine or a virtual machine that's supposed to be ephemeral, right? So now you're having to balance use of credentials during um, you know, a harness that, that really isn't meant for that. Uh, so some more about local development. Um, PowerShell variables and home drives. We learned some very valuable lessons um, when it comes to PowerShell variables and setting your home drives inside of um, uh, your test kitchen. So you need to make sure that home, home drive, and home path are not mapped out to the network. Um, if they are, um, if, you're in, if you're familiar with Berkshelf, a dependency resolution um, package, um, what will happen is Berkshelf will cache things um, at your home uh, location. If your home location is sitting on the network, what happens is it, it, it greatly extends the amount of time it takes to resolve those dependencies that are truly meant to be resolved down to your local workstation. Um, in our case, you know, we were using network profiles mapped out to a, um, a, a user drive. And instead of taking five seconds to do Berkshelf resolution, it was taking upwards of 15 minutes. Um, PowerShell profiles can definitely help out. If you're not familiar with the PowerShell profile, it runs once you open up PowerShell, um, but only if you have one defined. So you, you'll have to create a, a PowerShell profile and then put the code that you want to execute upon start of PowerShell. And so this, this is kind of handy because you're not going to really disrupt your end user computing area and, and mess with the, the, pro, or with the uh, environmental variables that they expect to see set just within the scope of your PowerShell uh, console. And just a little bit more about Berkshelf. So you might run into some proxy issues um, when dealing with Berkshelf, especially if it's a Windows-based proxy. Um, we actually encountered this during um, our, our most recent uh, Chef training on site, where our users had to uh, do kind of a workaround in order to be able to resolve Berkshelf dependencies. Um, so you can put a config.json placed inside of a, a .berkshelf folder at the root of a cookbook um, to set SSL verify to false to bypass that error. Um, you don't have to worry. Your, your proxy is still handling all the traffic. Um, it's just bypassing this particular error. And this is actually a, a pattern that's, that's pretty well known. Um, there's a, a great blog out there. Um, I believe it's called the, the, the Windows Development um, Survival Guide. Um, it's at blogs.chef.io. And it was written back in 2014. And I can tell you that's constantly bookmarked. And I, I refer to that every once in a while when I run into an issue that I can't figure out. So part of my... Uh, promise was to talk about Windows Server 2016 adoption. Um, and please forgive me, I need to talk about Server 2012 R2 first. Um, so Server 2012 R2 was our first platform uh, with Chef. It was, by and large, the majority operating system of the time, the newest thing that we were deploying. We spent about six or seven months getting really good at hardening and, and deploying uh, Server 2012 R2 instances with Chef and convincing our organization to adopt Chef um, at a larger scale. Um, when it came to the adopting Server 2016, it was, it was kind of earth-shattering. Windows Server, Server 2016 really just needed a couple of modifications in our code, and we were up and running. So normally, when you harden an OS, it, it can really take some time, right? Especially if you're building a new set of scripts for each operating system. 
Uh, but with Chef, we just needed a few minor modifications, right? We put a couple simple if statements in our code, and we were up, up and running, and this is not an exaggeration, within a few hours. It was like an afternoon, maybe part of the next morning, and we were ready to go in Server 2016 from a configuration standpoint. I mean, that would have taken weeks, maybe months of, of effort um, prior to that. So PowerShell, um, you know how I'm a PowerShell owner, right? I said that earlier. Um, if you ask my, my coworkers, I'll probably try to solve a problem with PowerShell before I even think about touching a GUI. Um, I just, I love object-oriented programming and the, the language is great. Um, however, when you're using Chef, try to use Chef native resources wherever possible. And there's, there's a couple of reasons for this. Configuration management languages are supposed to be declarative, not imperative. And what I mean by that is you're supposed to declare what your configuration is supposed to be. You shouldn't have to write every little piece of code to get there. Now, I'm not saying that if you can't find a Chef Native resource or a community cookbook that's going to do what you need to do, don't use PowerShell. I'm not, absolutely, I'm not saying that at all. Um, use PowerShell when you have to, but try to keep your code as simple as po uh, possible. That's one of the, the major strengths of, of Chef. Um, and when you're writing your own PowerShell resources, really have to keep an eye on your PowerShell versions. There's a huge difference, um, for example, if you're going to use PowerShell v4 versus PowerShell v5 and you're using PowerShell desired state configuration um, commands. That, that can really uh, throw you off and it's really hard to troubleshoot things like that. So try to keep your environment as consistent as possible. And follow good test-driven development practices. Especially with PowerShell, the commandlet to check the configuration is usually very, very similar to the commandlet that you're going to use to set your configuration. Um, and it's just a good pattern to follow. Test-driven development is a, is, is a, is a proven development uh, pattern that uh, we should be following regardless of OS. OK, so here's where I might start to cause a little bit of turmoil. Um, InSpec. Um, if you're not familiar with InSpec, it's uh, a compliance uh, language um, maintained by Chef that allows you to uh, check state on your nodes. And we found that it works great for group policy. So what I mean by that is, and I'm not telling you whether or not you should use group policy or you should use Chef to change settings. Quite often group policy maps back to the registry or some, some other simple commandlet that you can uh, run to check a command which is what makes it perfect um, for, for InSpec. So you might be using um, group policies that you know, your security area really wants you to, to keep applying and enforcing to prove that you're PCI compliant. You might not be very far along in your Chef journey and they might not understand that, that Chef can set these settings as well. Um, but you could definitely use InSpec to prove that those group policies are applying in the way that you want them to apply, especially when you've layered your group policy objects, right? Um, I've definitely um, discovered in our own environment how complex that can be when you have two or three group policy objects and you expect a setting to be one thing, but it's another um, because you didn't take the um, LSDOU uh, order uh, into account. So group policy is a really great gut check because, I mean, what other way do you know if your group policy is really applying? Um, so here's an example of uh, a basic group policy check for enabling LUA. Um, and you'll notice I have an only if statement in there. So in this case, I only care if server 2016 or newer is uh, applying this group policy object. And it reports right into the, the, the Chef Automate uh, UI. So what about Windows updates? Um, this question, it's, it's almost like a weekly uh, question on the Windows um, channel on Slack. Should I manage Windows updates with Slack? Um, can you? Yeah. Uh, do we? Definitely not. There's a few reasons for that. The git hotfix commandlet and git sim instance commandlets really don't reveal every single granular patch that's been installed on your Windows system. And so it becomes much harder to prove whether or not you should run um, a specific security patch or install. Um, custom sol solutions are definitely possible, but they're kind of unwieldy. If you want to um, write a custom registry key just to um, prove that you've installed an update on every single server, um, you can do that, but it's, it's, it's not a real sustainable pattern. Um, so I recommend that you use native OS solutions like WSYS if possible. And, and there's also some, some great SCOM um, integrations for monitoring. Uh, we uh, personally, we use ShareWell instead of our environment for our ticketing system. 
And we've been able to use uh, SCOM, Chef's API, and Sharewell to generate tickets based on uh, Chef client run failures. Um, and on that same vein, we've also been able to have those tickets auto heal the next time Chef runs successfully. So you know, every once in a while, Chef may, may fail a run, and it might be in an anomaly. And so in this case, we're, we're able to self-resolve tickets and kind of clear up the garbage out of our queue so we can actually see where the real problems lie. Chef Automate's API is also pretty robust. Um, you can actually read the stack trace and include that information inside of your tickets generated by SCOM. So you can actually understand what's going on on the server as soon as you open up the ticket. You can read where the client run failed, why it failed, what time it failed, and then start your troubleshooting from there without having to go to multiple places. And finally, um, we actually kind of started to think about this just before uh, I started submitting my uh, presentation here. It's actually, actually possible to have automated monitoring generate out of SCOM based on um, your cookbooks that are applying on your servers. The, the way I mean there is, it, for example, if you had like an application cookbook, write a registry key stating which monitors it wants, it's possible that if SCOM is looking in that location, for it to actually grab those and then build monitoring. So instead of teams having to put in a ticket to ask for monitoring, now it's possible for teams to include the monitoring that they want in their cookbook and have SCOM auto-generate it. So that's not a pattern that's unique to Chef, but it's just something that using this tool set has really opened our mind to, is how do we move the full stack control of an application to the, the development team rather than having it set on INO? There's also some interesting implications with IIS. And while Habitat is an amazing uh, solution um, that we've, we've definitely tried out at our organization, um, this was our, our primary use case for adopting Chef in the first place, that configuration drift I talked about earlier between our, our applications. We were able to make a lot of great gains um, using IIS. Um, it's, it's really possible to configure everything in IIS. So secrets like service account passwords for app pool identities can be pulled down from solutions like HashiCore and CyberArk. You can do certificate binding. Um, there's some native certificate binding in IIS. And, and really, I mean, I don't know about the rest of the world, but certificate binding could be one of the primary solutions or replacement um, to, to why a, a website might go down. Uh, you can also bind IP addresses, set things like anonymous and Windows auth, and really anything inside of a web.config for, for an IIS website or web application, you can definitely set with Chef. Um, there's an awesome community cookbook, um, the, the IIS cookbook, and we've uh, wrapped that internally and added some functionality to it. Um, for example, uh, we don't want to bind a cert to a website that's going to expire in the next 90 days, right? And on that same vein, because we know how to test for that, we're able to write an inspect test and have inspect let us know, hey, look, you have a cert that's expiring in the next 90 days on this web, uh, on this web server. So it's helping us keep track of our certificate lifecycle as well. So remember how I said we started off with PowerShell DSC? I really thought I had gotten away from it until I tried out Habitat. Um, so Chef has DSC resources that are built in. Um, they worked very, very closely with Microsoft in order to get that um, inside of the, the core Chef uh, functionality. So PowerShell DSC is, is still a viable option for those who want to use it or transform from using PowerShell DSC into Chef. Um, it's a one-to-one -one translation. It's, it's very simple. Um, I wouldn't consider them competing technologies, more of complementary technologies. And Habitat. Um, so Habitat packages will definitely use desired state configuration for uh, traditional ASP.NET applications, or really anything that you're trying to configure inside of a Windows container. Um, so I kind of I have a hackathon story to tell here. Um, so back in February, our organization did this hackathon and internally dubbed Build It, and we were just trying to inspire innovation inside of the organization. And there were a lot of developers out there um, trying out new API solutions and whatnot, but there were some infrastructure teams there as well, and we got to play around with Habitat. Uh, Chef supported us and, and sent a, a resource on site, and we were able to get a, a .NET Core application running in Habitat on a, on, in local development on a Windows Server 2016 instance in a container on Windows Server 2016 hosted in Hyper-V and then we reached for the cloud, and we were able to get that running in Azure Paz as well, right? Um, and we were using DSC the whole way, so it was, it was kind of this hybrid environment. But it's, it's a really powerful um, tool, so don't write it off entirely. You might find it useful, especially when you're trying to take one of those legacy applications, like you saw um, today during the keynote, 
right? When you're when you're trying to convert that application and get it to be a more cloud native application without a rewrite, um, these languages um, combined with uh, the power of Chef and Chef Habitat will really get you there. And so, how do we bring this all together inside of our organization? Um, so we internally uh, started off with Team Foundation Server, um, went to VSTS, and then eventually to Azure DevOps as the product evolved. Um, I know a lot of other uh, organizations will use tools like Jenkins and, and Jira, um, but Azure DevOps is definitely well suited uh, to the chef uh, cookbook lifecycle. Um, we do things like cookbook uploads, uh, versioning, variable and attribute replacement, version pinning, and really anything that has to do with the chef lifecycle can really be done inside of Azure DevOps. Um, I can tell you that it's definitely possible to map your release environments one-to-one -to, -one to your actual environments. So for development, maybe your testing environment, and maybe your production environment. And you can set up those release gates just, just like application developers do for their applications. So when you talk about closing the gap, Azure DevOps or Jira or Jenkins, really any of those tools can, can help you start speaking that same language that the developer is speaking. Um, and so before finishing up, I just want to emphasize um, that everything that happened in my organization didn't happen because of one individual. Um, it, it sounds uh, kind of cliche, but it did happen because of a team um, and others outside of the team trying to really support and accelerate the adoption. Um, it took commitment from leaders, um, countless other developers. Um, shout out to the Liger team if you're listening. Um, and, and, and really a, a ton of other just advocates for, for change. Right, You have to disrupt. Um, a lot of organizations Will, will get settled in their ways, and you really have to keep pushing the issue or things will just stagnate again. Um, so uh, I want to leave you with a few notes. Uh, use the community Slack. There's a ton of practitioners out there willing and ready to answer your questions. Um, there, a lot of people just ask questions on the Slack and go away, um, and that's okay. Um, that knowledge stays there, right? Others can reference that knowledge as well. Um, and give back, don't just take. If you figure something out, let people know or sanitize your code and put it out there for others to use. Uh, your organization might not be happy with you sharing code, but when, once you've learned a concept, there's really not a problem with sharing that concept with others. Um, that's what makes this community so great. And be excellent to each other. IT is incredibly stressful. I'm sure more than one of you is being asked to do more with less people. Let's help each other out. Let's take away the stress. Uh, so there's a link on this slide um, to a very basic Windows development starter kit. Um, it's, it's nothing exceptional, but it'll get you started, and it'll get you over some of those hurdles that I talked about earlier. Um, so I'll take questions from now until 1.45. For those not staying for Q&A, thank you for attending my talk. And for anyone who has questions, uh, we will be walking around with microphones um, so that we can get the uh, questions and answers captured in the recording. Uh, somewhere in the first part of the presentation, you mentioned not joining AD for your local test instances. Could you touch on maybe how far you take the not joining AD practice into upper test environments? Sure. Um, so our, our test environments are, are currently restricted to our local workstation. So once we promote our code to master branch, it's going to auto-deploy to like a development branch. Um, so those are domain-joined instances um, that the code is usually running on already. Um, so the, the servers are already provisioned. They're not ephemeral. Um, as far as how far I got with uh, domain joining um, during a test kitchen run, uh, I was personally successful in being able to pass in credentials into my test kitchen run and join the domain. Um, the trick came afterwards. Uh, I started to get some nasty grams on, what is this machine? What is this machine? You forgot to clean that machine up. Or if I left my laptop on overnight, somebody was asking, why is this in our domain? Um, so there's, there was just a lot more cleanup uh, than what was really worth it. And you know, I had, we definitely use Chef to define uh, permission groups and, and role groups and, and other security principles on objects. Um, but it, it's, it's really, it, it was easier to get it out to development and just test, test the functionality of the rest of the code um, than, to, than to force it to fail. You said you use SCCM for Windows updates? 
That's correct. Okay, how did you get the client installed and how do you update it? Sure, yeah, so um, we use the Windows package resource to install the SCCM client um, in the same with the updates. So um, there's this resource, um, you can definitely read about it on docs.chef.io uh, Windows package. And so the SCCM installer, um, I believe is in .exe, depending on how it's packaged for the most part. So you'll have to set a custom install flag on that. Um, so it's installer type custom. In fact, I think I have an example of a .exe um, inside of that, that uh, Kickstarter. Well, I found in my personal experience that the SCCM doesn't really uh, work unless it is domain joined. So that's what I was. Oh, for, for, local, for local testing? Yeah, that, that is one of those packages that's much more difficult to test locally. Yeah, because it, it has its hooks into the SCCM server to download the installer, yeah. Uh, did you face any challenges with uh, GPO applying changes to the instances once they were domain joined versus what Chef was trying to manage as far as configuration? No, um, not really. Um, we were, so fortunately uh, with server 2016 in particular, uh, it was, we were building those GPOs from scratch um, and, and we were able to avoid any overlap. Um, the same group controls both the GPO and the Chef stuff. Right, yeah, yeah. So, so we, we had um, full ownership of, of the operating system process. Uh, I could definitely see how that might be difficult if somebody, somebody else owns GPO and somebody else owns Chef. Um, that's where, where that, that communication really comes into place. So you might even, um, you know, my suggestion in that case is I'm going to start drawing on the keynotes uh, speech a little bit, um, start talking to those groups and ask them to write those inspect tests for their group policies that they expect to see applied. Um, and that will help inform you on, you know, as you're writing your code uh, to, not, to not kind of step on each other. I think I may know the answer to this question, but when did you have your aha moment and when did the executive management say, this is it? Like, when did the light bulb go on? <laughs> uh, all right, so server 2012 R2 story. Um, we had this server that wasn't doing so well. There were a lot of page faults in memory. We couldn't figure out what happened to this particular server, um, but fortunately it was chef managed. And we had gotten so far into the app configuration for, for not just one app, but for multiple applications that were relying on that server, that we were comfortable completely just powering off and destroying and reprovisioning the server. And we were back within an hour. We had the application configured and deployed and ready to go. And so that was the aha moment, right? Because you know, quite often people refer to their, their servers um, kind of like pets, right? There's this pet and uh, livestock analogy. And so our servers traditionally had been pets. Um, but now they're turning into livestock. They're replaceable. Um, and so it's not so scary at the thought that we might lose a server, especially if it's, its configuration is being managed by Chef, because it's, it's no problem to spin up another one. Uh, are you aware of the kit, uh, Kitchen Nodes uh, provisioner plugin? And have you tried looking at that? Uh, MW Rock has a blog article about doing a, essentially it would spin up an AD server and allow you to uh, um, configure another uh, uh, second machine as uh, well, using that AD server's uh, IP uh, to DNS and then domain join the two and then be able to test locally uh, AD join and stuff like that. Um, I am not familiar with it, but I think I'm going to get familiar with that. Um, that, that sounds like something pretty awesome. I've, I've worked with a lot of uh, Matt Rock's stuff, so. Uh, what was the name of the plugin? Is it Kitchen Notes plugin? Kitchen Notes? Yeah, if you do gem install Kitchen Notes and then you tr uh, replace the Chef Zero uh, provisioner in your kitchen file with notes, essentially what it does is it writes uh, the note information to the test directory and then when you spit up your second box, that gets copied over and then it knows a few of the automated, uh, like the IP address and the host name of the AD server, so then you could do a do domain join and stuff like that. That sounds pretty awesome. Would you be willing to share that on Slack or something? Yeah, yeah, I could do that. Great. So, so you talked a little bit about more of the front end middleware kind of servers. Um, have you done anything with Chef related to SQL Server databases, for example? So uh, we haven't um, started down our road 
uh, messing with SQL Server at all. Uh, we have played around a little bit with group policy, or not, not group policy, but compliance tests um, against uh, databases, and we found it um, is a potential way to verify configuration. Um, we uh, haven't quite got to the, the, the step of doing SQL Server installs or initial database configuration. Okay, uh, if there's no other questions, thanks for coming.